now i uh, request professor suvasne mukhopadhyay to deliver his lectures we hope that with time other people will come i don't see that everybody has come yet i think those who are coming from outside they might be having some problem of the traffic but anyway we'll start actually yesterday we were supposed to finish uh, this part but because of the inaugural ceremony it took more time so we could not finish this one so today in the first hour i will take the different terms especially when we think of making intelligent system not that we are making the new sensor so for making system so you have the sensor available in the market then when you select particular sensor what are the parameters you look into so it's basically kind of theoretical part many of you think that is basically you have learned in undergraduate course so it will be little bit of repetitions but we will look into in a different perspective sensors actually as i said the sensor is very very common in any different applications especially for our human being we are blessed with five different sensing organs actually not five is always the six because if you think of the brain that's the most important sensor come controller otherwise we have got our eyes we have got our skin nose ear tongue and we all know these days people use e so you will find papers research papers e nose e tongue so effectively they simulate the functionality of the human's organ using electronics when we have the sensors you will find that sensors and actuators they come very in a common way in an integrated form some system when we have the sensor you do not need to control anything you may not have any actuators but when you want to control something then actuators also come into picture so actuator means basically we want to you know do some action so it comes from that an actuator so sometimes you will not have a system when both of them changes the functionality and it will be difficult to say which one is sensor which one is actuator so we'll we'll show you some example so that's why it will be difficult to classify okay so we may say okay we want to tell if this particular device does such and such things it can be sensor and such such and such thing in actuators but we will be finding very difficult situation when we cannot draw the line and we have to get good data for analysis so sometimes definition and terms are confusing so we'll see that how do we define the sensors and actuators and why it will be difficult what are the principles involved sometimes in a situation where the discipline discipline is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary then it will be even much more difficult we need to go for a mixed approach while we design certain things so for example if you think of the designing of biosensor most of the engineering students will not have background of biology isn't it because we we did not study biology when we are in class 11 and 12 we decided we will be engineers we don't need biology but unfortunately if you are working on biosensor like me then you will find that you have to start biology or you at least ask like for me i am happy that i don't need to study i can tell my student to study but you have this problem similarly if you if you think of the chemical sensor so we we were actually especially those who are studying electrical electronics engineers we were quite good when we were in the school for me like personally i was i got highest marks out of physics chemistry maths in chemistry more than 92% but when i studied electric engineering i forgot chemistry i don't need anymore and now most of my sensor are all chemical equations and we find the difficulty okay i am lucky because my wife is a chemist so we can get help but not everybody is like me so that's the problem so sometimes i actually find that 
in earlier days we divided in a by a rigid line that okay you need only this you don't need other things but now when you go for doing research that division is no more and it's always becomes interdisciplinary most of the research you will find always interdisciplinary and that's actually quite important to pass the knowledge to the young students when they study you know in the class 11 12 or even in the initial years of the engineering degree program that don't be having that type of mentality better learn as much as possible so that that will help in future so we'll see that so mixed approach required and of course the units and range which will be important so as i said that this part will be a little bit of theory we'll see how we actually define a sensor so this definition is taken from different dictionary okay what they say how they are different from each other so if you say actually sensor once i try to pick up the terms which are quite synonyms of sensor and i ended up 27 terms because uh, when i became professor 5 years back my my university we have the system that we have professor of is not just professor so my designation is professor of sensing technology so head of the department or the university they ask you what professor you are you have to choose so ball comes to my court so then you have to decide what so i thought sensing is something which i actually like because i i started a conference on sensing technology that was in 2005 then i started a journal which is also sensing international journal of smart sensing and intelligent systems so i thought sensing i need to be there but professor of sensing doesn't mean anything isn't it so we have okay professor of sensing technology so that time i wanted to see actually how you can get different terms so i ended up with 27 different terms so if you see dictionary you will find that sensor means some people say it's a detector okay it's fine detector some people say pickup wow, okay pickup is we all call a yeah, pickup coil eddy current pickup coil so it's just specific to little bit transducer transducer is not exactly the sensor transducer is sometimes uh, can be sensor can be combination of sensors and actuators so you will get many some people just just to say probe but again probe means we always see probe means oscillator or oscilloscope probe isn't it something so it's very hard to satisfy what exactly sensor means so you will see then according to new college dictionary they say that sensor is a device that responds to a physical stimulus and transmit a resulting impulse and if you tell this definition to outside your engineering domain people may not understand then you have to tell what is exactly the stimulus okay and what is the impulse isn't it you will find difficulty to explain to a common man sometimes when we apply funding we have to write an abstract for the common man because common man means like in the ministry they do not have engineering background and if you do not write the layman's language you are out so th this is this definition is basically coming to the engineering domain american heritage dictionary a device such a photoelectric cell now if you take out that if you take out that because device photoelectric cell we don't think of photoelectric cell is a sensor isn't it photoelectric cell is something different but they use that that receives and respond to a signal or stimulus again you come to the stimulus and then you get the wave star a device that responds to a physical stimulus as heat light sound pressure magnetism or a particular motion and transmit a resulting impulse as for measurement of measurement of operating a control so here if you see all these three definitions you come to the common term the stimulus so stimulus is our like when we study in the second year of undergraduate program signals and systems you come to know stimulus so stimulus is something any input to any system so which is coming from the external world to the system that's the stimulus it can be anything 
It can be a force, it can be temperature, it can be anything. Sometimes you physically measure them, sometimes you can just feel them. So that stimulus is very important and due to the stimulus, if we think the sensor is a black box system, it will give some response. So transmission of that to a measurable something. If we cannot measure, it does not define as a sensor. So you have to have that relationship. Then what is the transducer? So transducer is something which actually, which actually changes something. So a device that is actuated by power from one system and supplies power usually in another form to a second system. So this power and energy that is coming here, that it does some actions. So you give some input and that actually changes and you can get from the, from the system as the output. Second one, a substance or device such as a piezoelectric crystal that converts input energy from one form into an output energy from another. So here actually you are getting the different forms of energy. So then you will find that if the form is the same, so you give like for example a transformer. Transformer you give electrical energy, you get electrical energy. So can you not define the transformer as a transducer? So it may not be perfectly true, isn't it? So you, you just cannot say that energy from another form. So you can say input, it's energy, output, it's also energy. It can be the same form or it can be the different form, but it should be the energy. And then Webster says a device that is actuated by power from one system and supplies power usually in another form, usually, okay? So usually to a second system that become. So all these three definitions, you will see they're very, very similar. They're not much difference. So like the sensor, we have seen stimulus and the response. Here also power from one form to the another form. So transducer basically you will find that they they are combination of sensors and actuators. Okay, so anything you can define as a transducer. If you say, I don't know exactly. Okay, just tell transducer. That will cover up. So then actuator, actuator is related to some action. A mechanism for moving or controlling something indirectly instead of by hand. So you are not allowing the manual intervention. So something without our intervention, we want to do some action. So you give power and it does some action. The action related to either moving, it can be the linear movement or it can be the rotational movement. So it, it is related to some movement, some change of displacement. One that activates especially a device responsible for actuating a mechanical device, such as one connected to a computer by a sensor link. So actuator always means that some kind of movement. Okay, some kind of movement. And one that actuates a mechanical device for moving or controlling something. So here you will find that out of these three definitions, actuator is very clear that you need some action. So then you will be confused. So now you will say transducer. Transducer, anything can be transducer. Sensor is a transducer, actuator is a transducer. Transducer is, can be a part of a system sensor or sensor can be part of a transducer. So if you, if you see transducer, you will be finding quite difficult that what is exactly the transducer. Many sensors can work as actuators. We'll, we'll get some example of that. So duality theorem, many actuators can work as sensors. Okay. And then you will ask that what is it then, so you will be confused. So let us say this example. So this example is one of the old example when the, when the usually the kids, they go to park and you will find, of course in India we don't see that much, but still there can be somewhere where you have got a big disc, they are separated for few hundreds of meters and you go to a disc and speak something, other people at other disc and they can listen very clearly. I mean that may be the, the experiment uh, Jagadish Bose did maybe more than 120, 30 years back, isn't it? So how the wave transmit through the air. So here if you see, somebody is speaking here, somebody is listening here, then if I ask you that, can you tell me this loudspeaker, 
whether it's behaving as a sensor or behaving as an actuator. It's very difficult to say, isn't it? Because both sides is the loudspeaker. You get my point? So here, that definition is quite confusing. So when we actually have this situation that sensors and actuator, they are combined, it's very difficult to tell that which one is behaving as sensor, which one is behaving as actuator, because they are, the functionality, they are inbuilt in both of them. So in this situation, somebody speak, so the sound energy that's converted into some kind of wave. Yeah, we always think a wave means electrical wave, but it need not to be, but some kind of wave. And then it's passed through this. If you have got wires, otherwise, of course, it, it goes to in the form of sound wave. And then in this loudspeaker, when that comes, that converts, and we can get back the sound. So if we say the sense, you are sensing sensor. So here, you may say this loudspeaker is a sensor, isn't it? Because it's, you are sensing the, the energy, which is coming as a electrical energy, converting into sound energy, and you are sensing. But also, it's converting. So it can be something like a transducer. So it's very difficult to tell whether they are both sensor and transducer, or you just say one is sensor, one is transducer. We change it to a toy of the children. So sometimes you have got the can of the Coke or any drinks, and you can use them with a tight string, and you have the same situation. So you will find that it's a combination of sensor and actuators. So effectively, what we need to understand is that sound and vibration, they are converted. So sound energy to vibration, then again the vibration, so it's the mechanical energy converted into sound energy. Now we come to the telephone, what we use. Of course, we don't use that type of passive type of telephone. So we'll come back to that. So again, the telephone line, you will see the same situation. So you have here converted energy sound to electrical goes through. And then again, you are converting the electrical energy to sound energy. In this case, we do not apply any power from external source. Of course, if you do not apply power from external source, then what will happen? The quality or the energy that will degrade with time, with distance. So you will be having difficulty of listening it properly at the other end. So that's what we have our, in our life. So when you think of this telephone, what we use, we need the power source. Because power source is amplify the signal, so you can take out the effect of the noise and other external factors. So this telephone system, you will have, you can say, define a definition that is a, it's a combination of sensor and transducer, everything. So now we can define what a sensor means. So you, when you think of sensor, you basically just get some signal. You are measuring something, you get some signal. So it's just the device which responds to a physical stimulus. So under the physical stimulus, you have everything. It can be mechanical, it can be thermal, electric, sound, all the things what we see around us that can behave as a stimulus. Transducers, it converts energy from one form into energy from another form. Okay? Now if this another form can be the same form what we have as input. So it's just the transformation. Okay? And the actuator is because is the capable of doing some physical actions. So now you can be very clear what you actually have in your system. And then the stimulus, anything which actually creates some kind of Yeah, I mean, it's not that physical means just like what we see. Physical means anything, okay? Existence of anything. Not exactly. You are, I'm not. I'm not separating the chemical out of that. Okay. I mean, physically, you mean that whatever you can feel the presence on the real wall. So the stimulus is the quantity which we want to measure. We want to sense that that can actually affect the system. 
and in sensor term we usually call this as measurement okay so anything you will see that we will we'll divide the measurement into physical chemical electrical mechanical uh, thermal so then so on and we can call them as general is the measurement which gives so now when we say sensor sensor is such a wide area is impossible for someone to be expert in all the areas it's just impossible because it's so wide like i never work on optical sensor it's just not me okay because sometimes you'll find that the instrumentation required is quite expensive sometimes the knowledge required is quite different so many people they they work on different different areas so that depends on the interest but it's a huge area and that comes because of the laws that dictate the operation of the sensor sometimes it can be physical laws we'll see so and based on that we can actually define different types of sensor so sensor can be called active and passive if you are lucky that you can work with passive sensor you can actually uh, eliminate lot of problems so we'll see active sensor and passive sensor then the sensor contact non contact sometimes you need the sample to be in physical contact with your sensor but sometimes you can use non contact so when you use some kind of wave you don't need the contact but depends on the application then absolute and relative sensor in general you will find that most of the sensor are basically relative sensor hardly you get absolute sensor there are some which are absolute and then it can be some other schemes so you will always find that active and passive what do we mean by active active means anything if you have a power source in our life you will have only three passive elements okay resistance inductance capacitance if you find anything else other than that you actually come into the domain of active so you know people use operational amplifier they are all going to in the active zone because you need a power supply so whenever you need a power supply external power supply then it becomes active sensor so without power supply it will not work so few example you will see that microphone what we have the the recent telephone thermistors strain gauges capacitive inductive sensor now you may say that inductive sensor how can you actually the active but it is actually coming because you need the power source to measure without that you cannot okay similarly the capacitive sensor you need the power source to measure you can have the capacitance which is changing due to the change of either permittivity or area or so you will have that similarly passive sensor generates own electrical signal and does not require a power source you think of the thermocouple thermocouple if you have two dissimilar material you connect one is a reference temperature or this is some other temperature at the output you get some electrical signal so you do not need any power source to get that signal of course you can measure that with the with the your circuit and other thing magnetic microwave piezoelectric sensor this passive sensor also called self generating sensor because they are generating some external signal which is you can measure so definition of the passive sensor means also self self generating sensor any confusion here oh, we are not generating power that is not the aim okay so we we want to get the signal due to the external stimulus so if you say if you if you think of that the what exactly you want to measure instead of, without the application of the power or with application of power so the thermocouple you get some signal okay which is electrical signal you can measure that without even any kind of power source but if you see it's like for example strain gauge you apply any force any pressure you get the change of resistance or change of you no know, dimensions but you cannot measure that so you need to apply the power and that's why we call it active sensor you get the definitions so it may be little bit confusing that why if you say if you say that a, a resistance changes how do you measure it get it so 
when we say self generating sensor they are the absolute passive sensor because it gives you some voltage which you can measure you do not need any voltage to measure so this is little bit confusing but that's the way so contact and non contact sensor so contact sensor means we need physical contact so for example strain gauge strain gauge is very famously used for many mechanical system especially if you think of that measurement of the weight if you do not give the actual pressure because you have to change the dimensions you have to make some deformation so you need to have the contact so strain gauge and also the temperature sensor temperature sensor other than the the thermography you actually need so body temperature if you want to put the sensor on the body if you if you do not touch you actually don't get the temperature because the air gap that can create a huge problem and the non contact sensor there are other types of sensor especially when you use magnetic field or electric field you do not need any kind of contact so non contact sensor are also very common so mostly optical magnetic sensor all these are non contact sensor then we come to the definition of absolute sensor and the relative sensor relative scale so absolute sensor basically it is related to some absolute measurement thermistor they can give or strain gauge they can give absolute because you for example the strain gauge strain gauge you actually get the change of length or change of area so that's the absolute property of that particular material you need to scale it up to measure into different voltage or something but it comes to the absolute property of the material and that's what you will find the gauge factor gauge factor is the material dependent so you do not have the gauge factor of different material as same because the property is different so those type of things you can actually get the absolute measurement but you sometimes measure different parameters with respect to different parameters so for example thermocouple thermocouple you do not actually get absolute value you get the relative value because it gives the relative difference between the two temperature so that gives you the temperature difference not the absolute value of course you may say i can get the absolute value because if i keep my reference at fixed then i know but it doesn't matter your difference of the temperature that decides what is the signal you get you understand so absolute and relative is just when we use some reference we get the output so that becomes the relative scale actually in 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 our world you will get very few as the absolute most of them are relative and that's why when you do the experiment when you the characterize the sensor it's very important that you characterize you get the calibration curve because you will find that most of them are actually relative so there are only few which you find as the absolute and also most of the sensor they are actually environmental dependent so environmental factors also can play a major role so you will not get the absolute value no those factors will not come here i mean that will be coming uh, accuracy and other things which will come to come later but those i mean when you say the absolute value absolute value mean irrespective of anything but we usually don't have sensor that type of sensor in our life so most of the time we will find that it's relative now we'll define the sensor which we are familiar with and they are basically based on the type of detections so electric sensor you will find the electric sensor means related to electric anything related to electricity okay so voltage sensor current sensor all can be power all can be related to electric magnetic when you use the magnetic field we can define them as magnetic sensor so like you can think of hall effect sensor is one class type of magnetic sensor electromagnetic where you have got both electric and magnetic combined so you are using the electric field as well as you are using the magnetic field so that becomes electromagnetic acoustic related to sound chemical related to some kind of chemical reactions optical related to light heat temperature this is the heat and temperature 
mechanical, some kind of mechanical force or pressure, then the radiations, which is also type of optical, but not exactly the optical. So radiation means we, it's, it's all related to the like some energy radiating from a source, and it can be even without any medium. So you you can have also the vacuum, like we get the the sun energy from sun, and then biological. So where we use some kind of analyte. This is the definitions everybody actually come when they are working in the area of sensor because you will find that you are working in one or two areas. Okay. So like for for our lab, we work on electric sensor, capacitive sensor using the electric field. We also use magnetic field and to some extent electromagnetic. And of course, because our sensing things is related to biology, we can push ourselves that we are also working on biosensor. But actually we are not. You understand? We are working basically on electric sensor using electric field. But because our parameters our biological parameters, we still can qualify ourselves as biosensor or to some extent as chemical sensor because sometimes chemical reaction takes place, but not in a hardcore definition. So these are the definitions depends on the area of work. Now those definitions may not be true if you come to the physical principles or the laws based on which the detection or the conversion takes place. So now you see the laws, physical laws. So the photo, now you will find interesting thing that whenever somebody works in some area, they usually refer to some law. So for example, optical sensor, you will find the people use that B.L. Lambert's law, okay. Mechanical sensor, people use Newton's, most of the time Newton's law. Electrical sensor, most of the time people use either Ohm's law or maybe some other, there are a lot of laws, Thevenin's, Kirchhoff's, uh, not on, I mean, so many. But you will have that type of law, which is the kind of a founding principle of that operating principle of that particular domain. So physical laws you will find photoelectric, magnetoelectric, thermoelectric, photoconductive, magnetorestrictive, photo electro-restrictive, photomagnetic, thermoelastic, thermomagnetic, thermo-optic, th electrochemical, magnetoelastic, photoelastic, I mean so many you will find. So laws wise you will have each one have different laws. Now in, in terms of the, your research, you will find that it is better to know the laws and also the mathematics behind that and especially it will be very useful we engineers, we make things, we think that making the things is the end of the world. But when you think of publication of papers, you will be needing those laws because if you do not give some mathematical equations which actually describes, it will be very difficult to get your paper accepted. Okay? Sometimes that equation you use may be very simple. but it will be very difficult to have a journal paper, conference paper, forget. Conference paper is for making money, so it's not an issue. So journal paper without a, not one, few equations. So mathematical equations are very, very important. So whenever you do something, you better know what is the laws. I mean laws basically you will find they have representation of mathematical form. I mean I'm not telling the laws statement, but the laws mathematical representation. So that will be quite useful and very important to know. So now after that we will now define the sensor in terms of selection of sensor, what are the parameters we need to know. So any manufacturer, any manufacturer when they develop some sensor and they sell it to the customers, people always look into the definitions. Okay. So what are those which actually quantifies the sensor? So we will come across accuracy, sensitivity, stability, response time, hysteresis, frequency response, range, resolutions, linearity, hardness for some parameters. Cost may not be 
in that classifications, but cost can be one of the important thing. Size, weight, construction material, operating temperature. Most of you know those terms, but we will quickly go through. Also, you will find that any sensor or anything actually, any product, when you select, you actually need to know what is the applications. So, in general, we use maybe most of the time it is the consumer products. Now, consumer products and if you design something for the military product, it is a huge difference. The cost will be almost 10 to 20 times when you have military product. So, for particular example, if you think of any, any integrated circuits, you will see that normal case we take maybe minus 25 degree centigrade to let us say 100 degree centigrade. But when it is a military, it goes to minus 75 to 150 degree centigrade or even wide range. So, that makes the system very expensive. So, military applications is quite different. Similarly, infrastructure, energy, heat, manufacturing, transportation, automotive, avionic, marine, space, scientific. So, we need to be very clear where we are using it. Otherwise, it will fail. And especially when you, if you are a designer working in a company, the very first thing is you need to decide your specifications. You understand? So, if you want to make a particular sensor or a particular product, what usually you do? If you are making something completely new, you may be lucky. You understand? Because you do not have anything to compare. You come out, come out with something on your own. But if you are making something which already existing in the market, so what you need to do? You need to ask other vendor, other manufacturer to send their quotation, I mean their specifications. And you have to sometimes you have to behave that you are not working in a company, isn't it? So they will tell you the as you are a customer they will tell you all the details. Once you get that, then you have to finalize your specifications, which is a quite a hard task. Now, once you have the specifications, you are making the system, either sensor or a system. I mean, sensor is a part of the system. So, either a sensor or a system, you come up, you make it, then it is not your job to qualify and quantify the product there is a particular group who is completely unbiased. They are called testing group or I do not think is maintenance, maybe they are testing and quantification, some, some can be different name. They will do different test and those test based on your specification. So, when I work in Compton Grips many, many years back, we were involved with two product, it is not a sensor, it is the product. One was uninterrupted power supply. Okay. So, I am talking about 1989, 88, 89. So, uninterrupted power supply and uninterrupted, that is some com computer was not very new, but still. And our aim was that we will have the uninterrupted power supply between the, the computer desk and the monitor. So, it will go as sandwich. So, we made the things and we gave it to the testing department with our specifications. So, they will do the test. After a few days, they will come. So, the testing man is a Maharashtrian, a huge, quite good built, very nice looking man. You will see him and you will not tell that he is Indian, such a fair guy. And he used to come to our department, you know, laugh in his face. And when we see that laugh, we thought that it fell. No way that it passed. And it was kind of nightmare for any designer. Because you will be surprised that you give the temperature range minus 25 to let us say 100 degree centigrade. And what you will do? 
you will set 100 degree centigrade, put your product, put your, no? and he will see how it works. And when you designer, you are doing, you are testing, you are very scared to make it 50, 55, you know, but he will straight away do 100 and do it. And it will definitely fail. Another important thing which we don't care, but it's very important, you will see sometimes that uh, gravity, okay? You write 1G, 2G. I mean, 2G is very difficult to get, isn't it? But 1G, basically what? He will take your product, drop it. <laughs> it's falling with G. And after falling on the ground, you can understand many screws and <laughs> they just... So it's very, very important when you designer finalizing the specification. Now you may ask that, can I actually reduce it? You cannot, because you, if you are a, making a new product, as I said, if making a new product, you are lucky. But if you are making something which is existing, your specification must be better than your rival. Because if you give worse, you don't expect that you will keep your job, isn't it? Because your boss, he is smarter, that's why he is your boss. So you have to come up with the better specification compared to the existing situation. And that puts you under different situation. So these are the things you have to be very, very careful of. Now in actuators, we will have different types of classification again. Sometimes you will find linear and rotational. Linear motor, linear actuator, many times very handy. Like uh, last week I was in Portugal, they made a uh, platform with some kind of uh, actuator which is not, not like uh, string or spring, but it's like a, it's, it's not exactly hydraulic too, but they use air, it's a pipe, when you push the air, it becomes, it diameter becomes more, length becomes less. And so it is a platform where it is hanging with four different actuators and you can make, controlling them, you can make any, either any movement, vibration or any kind of eccentricity. So it's quite useful. That is actually based on the linear movement. So linear movement many times is very difficult to achieve. Rotational movement because we are more familiar with different types of motor, whether it's a stepper motor or DC motor or some cases maybe induction motor or something. So rotational movement is much more easier to implement than the linear movement. So it depends on what type of movement we have. Then comes down to axis, one axis, two axis, three axis. In terms of classification power based, we do not have much issue. So always we know that signal, when we deal with the signal, the electronics are always low power electronics. When you have high power, basically is the power electronics, okay? So it can be low power, high power, micro power. So sometimes the, when we talk of the sensor nodes, it can be basically micro power, maybe hundreds or thousands of micro power, micro watt or so. So they are the actuators. Also, when we think of the interface, because sensor always you have to connect to some kind of embedded processor. So you mean you are coming a stage where you have got the instrumentation electronics, which is the ele interfacing electronic. So you will come across matching, which is not very popular to the sensor engineers, but still you may have it. So matching impedance, but matching impedance most of the time, it is like you are dealing with the passive situation. If you have active, where power source is there, you may not have that much requirement of matching impedance. So you have to match the voltage, current, power. Sometimes you have to transform either direct current to alternative current or alternative current to direct current, voltage to frequency or frequency to voltage, and then you go analog to digital or digital to analog. And then you have got the matching of specifications. Also, you may say that the interfacing, the current system, it is not suitable, so you have to think of alternative design. 
Units is not that much complicated at the moment because most of the cases we follow the SI units, so we do not have much issue. But earlier days, of course, unit was the issue. You have to always transform. If you are having some other unit, you have to always transform to SI units so that you don't have any confusion there. Especially, it comes to it comes to uh, depends on the the depends on the sensor or the product made from different countries. So you may have something from America and something from UK. They might use different units, and that can be a problem. So you just need to be converting into SI unit. Okay. So now let's say one particular example. We have a sensor. We connect it to the processor, and the processor does some kind of action. So that's the very simple schematic. So in order to do that, we may have the processor, which can be microprocessor, which can be some kind of amplifier. And for actuators, we need the some kind of driving circuit. So some simple schematic. Then we need to match between the sensor and the processor. And we have to match between the processor and the actuators. OK? So for example, you use the sensor as a thermocouple. Now thermocouple gives you always in the order of microvolt. Your processor may take between 0 to 3.3 volt. Now you cannot connect just 100 microvolt to the processor, isn't it? So this processor, effectively, you are connecting to an analog to digital converter. So if you think of that your supply voltage is 3.3 volt, and you are dealing with 8 bit ADC, so that means basically you can measure 3.3 divided by 256. That's the minimum you can measure, isn't it? And that comes down something like how much? Around 16 or 17 millivolt. So any microvolt, forget about it, it will be just noise. So that is the important thing to decide. Of course, you may say, I will go for 12 bit. Yeah, 12 bit, your resolution will be better. But you need to know. And that comes down that how many bits you can allow as the error. Most of the situation, you actually allow as one LSB. Okay? So one bit, so that much signal is the range. Similarly here, for example, you get only 0 to 3.3 volt. But you are dealing an actuator, which is a motor which operates at 24 volt, or it operates at higher voltage. So what can you do? So you have to come up with another circuit so that you can take the drive signal, but that is used to drive the actuator. Oh, I've got the same example. So here, let us say we have got a thermocouple, which gives 50 millivolt as the maximum output for a different situation. You are connecting to microprocessor, which is working at 5 volt. And you have the fan, which operates at 12 volt. OK? So the purpose is to control the fan depending on the temperature. So you can change the speed of the fan depending on how much is the temperature heat of the system. So as you see, only this schematic which is very simple to represent. But we are now going to a little bit complex situation. You get this, because you have now A to D. But your A to D directly is not coming. You have got some kind of signal conditioning circuits. So the instrumenters and engineers, they become handy here. So your signal, what you have here, you need to first amplify, because maximum signal you get 50 microvolt, 50 millivolt, sorry, 50 microvolt. You need to amplify to make it to 3.3 volt corresponding to your, or 5 volt corresponding to your maximum operation. So you need that amplifier. And that amplifier itself will not be able to do everything. Because here, you have to think of that your noise is coming. So you may have to have some kind of filter to eliminate the noise, or even to reduce the F interference from other sources. So you need to have those signal conditioning circuits. So signal conditioning circuit itself is a 
very important area and you need to take proper care before you design anything. Then it goes to analog to digital converter. After that you write few lines of program. Basically in this case very simple that okay if the temperature is this and this you do this, this and this, do this or if below this switch it off, above this switch it off or something like that. So some kind of logic statement will come and after that you give it to output if you want to control then it goes to D to A converter okay. Otherwise you can also go for PWM that how much will be my duty ratio. Then it goes to the driver and the driver converts this signal to the appropriate voltage to drive the fan because you are operating at 12 volt is not at 5 volt okay. You may have 5 volt fan because these days you can see you can have fan coming from USB but it depends on the applications is not it depends on the applications. Now all these things all these things except the thermocouple you can have in one package okay and that is what we call it smart sensor. So you will find that when we say smart sensor what is the difference between sensor and smart sensor? Some people also like to use the term called intelligent sensor okay. So you may, you may actually ask what is the distinction, what is the difference between a smart sensor and intelligent sensor. So actually smart sensor is very simple, Impl intelligent sensor is complicated okay. So smart sensor effectively you have got all these things in one package. You have the sensor which is connecting to the physical world but it terminals comes to the sensor. You have the signal conditioning circuits, you have the processor, you have also the driver everything inside one package. So if you say everything in one package it is a smart sensor. But how do you know the signal is coming is the correct signal okay smart sensor does not do that okay. How do you know that the data which is coming need to be corresponding to the actual measure end. So I am talking about the calibration smart sensor does not do that but intelligent sensor can do that. So the intelligent sensor have the extra feature it can do the adaptation it can do the calibration, it can do any extra things which you can think related to the intelligence. You understand? But nobody talk about the intelligent sensor, everybody talk about the smart sensor. You understand why? Because intelligent sensor becomes very very complicated to make and you cannot have intelligent level exactly the same for different applications because it changes with the application. So you do not have eye sensor like iPhone, you understand? You do not have intelligent sensor, you have all smart sensor, clear? So smart sensor does not do the extra things, it can just get the data, convert it, put it to the system or transmit it using wireless. If you could do that everything in one package is enough, that is smart sensor, clear? Signal conditioning why? Signal conditioning will be different things. Signal conditioning can be uh, filtering the noise, eliminating the noise. I mean most of the time is basically filter circuit converting the uh, voltage to current level, current to voltage level. Most of the time signal conditioning is something like that but there can be some extra things. Uh, for signal conditioning but mainly signal conditioning will be related to noise rejection, noise eliminations and changing the voltage to frequency, frequency to voltage, voltage to current, current to voltage all these things. In fact you will, you will have the material of my book one chapter is actually on signal conditioning so you can have a look. You have a access of the material is not it? Anyone has got any problem of accessing the material? I mean uh, you got the CD where you have all the material so please have a look. 
So you will have there are two books. One book is the called Intelligent, uh, Intelligent Sensing and Instrumentation and Measurement or Intelligent Sensing Measurement on Instrumentation. I don't remember. So there you will have seven chapters. In one chapter, you will have the signal conditioning. Yeah, I mean, you can make it as a closed loop system to make it intelligent, to make it better. But mass, mass sensor is just a, you can say it's a, it's a package of all the elements together. So it doesn't really care what it is actually getting. No? Yeah. But intelligent sensor, it will be very difficult to make without huge amount of software. Hmm. You always need a huge amount of programming to implement intelligent sensor. Okay. So now we can actually do the alternative design instead of using thermocouple you can go for a temperature sensor. Now thermocouple and temperature sensor are quite different. Thermocouple you can make on your own and you can calibrate in your lab. You can characterize and then the calibration curve gives you what is the temperature. But if you use LM35, which is a common temperature, like those who actually uh, use baby monitoring, you may use LM35. Isn't it? It's very tiny sensor, flat surface. It can touch on the skin. So when we use our emotion, that was one of the sensor we use. So you can get. It's not very high between zero to fifty degree centigrade or fifty-five degree centigrade, and you can get a quite linear curve. So you can use that, but it needs power supply. Okay, you have to give the power supply, and you forget about making your other circuit. If you use thermocouple, you need to have your amplifier, you need to have signal conditioning circuits, but actually it is everything there inside. So you may say that it saves a lot of my work, but you pay the price. Understand? Sometimes actually better to give that money so that you actually don't have the issues of interference. Because interference is a very difficult issue to tackle, uh, especially if you have thermocouple where you have got long wires, you always can have pickup. So it's very difficult. So you can use that type of sensor for your applications, and then of course you can get the data. Just write the direct program because it gives you the direct signal, which you can directly get in your processor. You do not need to worry about the right, having the interfacing circuits. So this part you just have only, and then of course the similar things. But you have a problem. Thermocouple actually give you the wide range. So there are different types of thermocouple, depending on the material, okay, it's type J, type K, type H, you have got different range, and they are actually different material. Whether nickel, cadmium, nickel, constant, different range, material gives you different range, and the sensitivity also becomes different. Okay. So you get up to like 2000 degree centigrade if you use thermocouple. But with that, you don't actually expect to have that type of range, isn't it? I mean, whenever you have any IC package used for your specific applications, you don't expect that that will operate at harsh environment, never. Harsh environment means like your temperature is more than 150 degree centigrade, your pressure is more than 5,000, 6,000 psi. Is the completely different domain. See, last year I have visited, I visited uh, Saudi Arab, and Saudi Arab they they have huge amount of oil, and they extract oil from the earth. But Saudi Arab basically, even though they think that they are actually floating on oil, but still they need to experiment where they can get more oil. They cannot make the whole country, you know. <laughs> you understand? Now, these days, they extract three kilometers deep. You understand? Three kilometers deep. And while they do, they actually come up with sometimes some kind of explosive gas. Okay? Some rocks, when they break, the rocks blast. And those accident, they can destroy the driller. And each driller is like 200,000 US dollar. So they want to detect the presence of that dangerous gas 
or presence of that dangerous rock before they actually drill. So, I had a meeting with the Saudi Aramco, that is the company who is responsible for that and they are telling can you de develop sensor. You can understand only just rubbing your hands you make things warm. When a drill machine is cutting the earth, it the temperature becomes almost 175 to 200 degree centigrade. They use mud to cool it down because normal water will be steam, is not it? So, water cannot be used for cooling. So, they use mud. So, how can you develop sensor for that type of applications? And then if you even if you can detect that okay, you can detect presence of some dangerous gas or rock, how can you send the signal? So, it is very, very difficult situation for the engineers. So, if you could develop that type of things, they will be very happy because my student work there every morning they start work at 7 o'clock because temperature in the daytime goes to 48, 49. So, they work 7 to 12 and then in the evening another few hours. So, the morning he is in the drilling section, morning they have a meeting that can we save 200,000 dollar today? You understand? That is the they are early morning pray, <laughs> pray means like yeah, it is not the literal pray, but they discuss that can we save today 200,000 dollar. So, they asked me can you develop something? Of course, it is not easy, okay. but there are companies who actually try in Europe and they try to say oh you use our system and you can do, but it is very hard. So, that is the new one, I mean when they explore some new place, not the old one where they have already you know established and extracting oil, that usually not a problem, but when they extract, when they find something new, you need that type of situation. So, it is quite hard because if you have some specification which is out of the range, achievement of that is really, really difficult task. So, temperature sensor is very common in our life, different applications we need temperature sensor. And if you see the temperature sensor either in the industry, home, incubator which is quite useful uh, baby monitoring, food industry is very important as I told you that yesterday that if you do not keep the food under proper environment, you always have the danger of having pathogen to grow. So, you have to have temperature sensor to monitor that automotive industry and solar energy conversion. So, you need temperature sensor in every applications. So, one of the common was very, very old is the bimetallic strip. Still, you can have that in some applications. RTD based on resistance of the metal, you can find out the metal and then the what is the temperature coefficient. From that, you can find out what is the temperature. Then diode, normal diode, you can still use it as temperature sensor. In fact, when I was at Jadavpur, my PhD was determination of temperature rise of the motor due to some either harmonics or unbalancing of the power supply. Now, how can you determine the temperature of the winding when the motor is running? So, what I did? I inserted diodes inside the stator coil. Okay. Rotor is not an issue if it was induction motor. For induction motor, rotor is not an issue because it is the aluminum, especially the squirrel cage motor is the aluminum, temperature is not a problem, it will not melt, it can go 300, 400 degree centigrade. But in the stator, you have the insulation, it is not the bare copper, so the insulation, insulation can melt. So, you need to know the temperature sensor, the temperature, but when the motor is running, see you may say oh fine, I can raise, I can measure that resistance of the winding, but then you have to switch up, is not it? You can switch up, then you can take the terminal, measure the resistance, but that is not the solution because you have to run the motor. So, what we did? We inserted diodes. Now, normal silicon diode at 20 degree centigrade, you get 0.7 volt. When the temperature rises, the diode drops, diode drops, voltage across the diode drops. So, by measurement, 
you can get roughly you can get the temperature but one of the problem is that you need to characterize it before you use it usually it's called 2 millivolt per degree centigrade but it's not general if you are not too much bothered about the accuracy you are fine but you have if you say uh, i need to know exact then you have to characterize it okay so the characterization is quite useful so the diode is gives you that type of characteristics usually 2 millivolt per degree centigrade depending on the material it can go up to 400 degree k which is actually like 130 degree centigrade so you can use these days you get temperature sensor based on this principle from different company so the motorola one of the product is mts 105 you can go up to 160 degree centigrade and minus 40 degree centigrade so they based on diode then the thermocouple which is based on seebeck effect so you can see copper constant constantan or nickel constantan nickel chromium so there are huge amount of applications of the thermocouple and most of them most of them are in the industry because industry environment is quite harsh you will find thermocouple is quite useful one of the applications of the thermocouple is that is the wires is very thin uh, last year one of my student developed a project basically to measure the sap flow sap flow have you heard of that sap flow is basically the liquid what the plants draws from the ground is it is water along with some nutrients now you may say that normally we do not care about the plant because the plant takes water sunlight makes their food due to photosynthesis but if you are in saudi arab or if you are in desert maybe some parts of rajasthan and if you want to plant where water is very very costly thing okay in saudi arab your petrol will be maybe 20 rupees liter but water is 80 rupees liter you understand water is much more expensive than petrol so some people say oh, we can drink petrol but unfortunately we cannot so what is important is to give water to the plant when it can make maximum of it you understand so my student he developed a system with thermocouple inserted the thermocouple inside the stem and it can measure the stem sap flow and it re it actually relates the light and the water so you can give water when it make the maximum use of it so that's what in the saudi arab i was quite surprised every plant has watering system and they give the water at certain time you understand it's not that early morning you go everybody is getting water it's not like that they give the water based on when the water will be maximum utilized so there are a lot of work on that i mean i actually did not know before my student came with came to me for that project because he he got that project from a company and the company has a business in saudi arab it's a new zealand based company they have the business saudi arab for taking care of plants so it's a big business but so i learned quite a few things so this is important now if you think of the temperature because you have to measure the temperature inside the plant you may actually come up with different types of sensor but you have to understand that you are actually pricking so your sensor need to be very very thin and that's the reason thermocouple qualifies because other sensor like thermistor thermistor based on some kind of resistance and these days the resistance comes as a ic okay and it's little bit thick it's like 2 mm by 2 mm whereas thermocouple you get so like quarter of a millimeter dia so it's quite handy so in some applications you have to consider that type of requirement okay so 
Okay, so here if you see the thermocouple, they have different types of sensitivity depending on what material you use and sometimes you actually need to calibrate it before you use, characterize it. So the selection of sensor is very important for your applications and we need to consider quite a few important considerations. As I said this one yesterday, availability is one of the most important thing, cost is another important thing, but you do not ignore the performance specifications, so you have to consider them too. Few years back, I had a master student who developed a wireless monitoring systems of greenhouse, okay. Greenhouse means you know that some specific plants like capsicum or something, you monitor the environmental parameters, temperature, humidity, air flow, light intensity, so it's basically covered. So we developed that type of system to monitor. So it's a master project, one year. Master in New Zealand is one year. So when he started, I asked him that come up with the selection of temperature sensor and humidity sensor. Of course, he has some other sensor. Now after two months, it took quite some time you always go to internet and search, isn't it? But internet is such a lousy thing, you do not get the right thing, isn't it? And after some time, you just lose interest. Or after some time, you come up with the completely nonsense. So it's very difficult to get the right information, isn't it? So he took quite some time and of course there are some other methods of measurement of temperature and humidity, but that is the summary you can have. So we have here principal thermocouple RTD thermistor and integrated circuit based, temperature range, stability, accuracy, repeatability, sensitivity, response time, linearity, self heating, size and of course cost. So you can summarize, you can see which one should be the best for your applications but then the cost and the availability will be very important consideration to select. So this is one of the thing which it does not matter whether you are doing master or doing PhD, but if you do not have your sensor, you cannot make the system. So you need to select because you can order only when you select, is not it? So this is very, very important and unfortunately you do not get a table to use in your applications you have to make your own table, okay. So that is the one of the thing. So this part actually I have a student he is working on and I tell you the, the story why you are trying to develop. There are many sensors available for measurement of soil temperature. So absolutely there is no problem. But we in New Zealand what happened, I mean in New, not only New Zealand in every country is what happened watering the soil is a big problem, is not it? Because water is very scarce, you do not get good water too much and you have to think of wastage. So usually now what happened, we, we uh, water the soil by a constant rate. So if you, if you come to New Zealand anytime, you will find that it is a huge amount of like almost 200 to 300 meters of pipes, they are connected and the pipes every 1 meter there are some spray and that gives water for few minutes, then it moves, it gives water another few minutes, move that way. So it is basically it just goes in a circular way and that time is they say, they, they use the term called precision agriculture and they do, what they do, they actually measure the moisture level of the ground of the soil at different parts. So they have a small uh, tractor and the persons, he have a moisture sensor, so he goes, put that moisture sensor, it is basically a stick, put the moisture sensor, note down, so with a GPS locations and moisture sensor, so he does that whole paddock. So you can understand that if you have got 80 paddocks, one paddocks will be like one hectare, it is a huge land. 
after that he comes to his office and he in, enters the data effectively he wants to get kind of a map with the moisture level and then he feeds that to the irrigator that is called irrigator. So, the irrigator use that data and then go either 1 minute, 2 minute, 3 minute. So, that is what they do at the moment and that is very popular in New Zealand. Okay? Those farmer who has got money they use that. What we are thinking that if I actually have a irrigator which is a tractor. So, the tractor is connected with water pipe and and the front end you have a sensor which measure the moisture level of the soil that data can be fed immediately to the controller. Controller will be at the rear end of the tractor and that can control the flow. So, that is what the idea and I just had a student last year final year student undergraduate. So, he started some work, but it is not the ideal situation at the moment. So, okay. so soil moisture is very, very important. I mean it is not only for New Zealand, it is everywhere and I sometimes feel that when I was small agricultural scientists we used to hate, it is not hate, but we did not give any respect, is not it? Oh, we will study computer science, electrical, electronics, mechanical. Ah, agriculture ah, is the rank is very very bad, but if you see the their importance in our life, think of that. No agriculture in the whole world, isn't it? How much hungry you will be? So it's very important. So the measurement of soil temperature is really really important because if you do not have proper water in the soil, soil will not give any food, isn't it? no crop nothing. So, this is very important. So, what do they do? They actually need to know the moisture level because moisture level and the productivity they are related. Of course, it is not one day two day affair it is almost like three to four months depending on what type of crop you have. So, they, what they do they measure the soil temperature using the sensor and they take like within 10 meter you have got with a circle you have got few measurement and they take the average reading and also how much depth it depends on again the crop some crop you may need few centimeter some crop you will 10 to 15 centimeter you know I am not talking about the big plant big plant is different situation they can get their roots very deep and they can get the water. So, it is not a problem, but if you think of grass grass usually do not go so deep only few centimeter if you think of the padding it does not go for that deep. So, important is for that. So, it is basically at the upper surface of the earth, but still few inch or few centimeter deep. So, they take a 3 measurement or 5 centimeter depth, 3 measurement 10 centimeter depth and they can find out the average value which is they use. Now, usually in the thermometer they cannot when they make it the hole, they cannot use the sensor to make that go at the deep. So, they have to have a spacer. So, they make that and then they use. So, the spacer they can remove. So, it is basically whole otherwise you can have the spacer, but the spacer will not affect the temperature so much, okay. but they have to have the spacer to protect the sensor. So, they can make this PVC spacer and they make the depth. So, you can see at 5 centimeter they make 2 7 centimeter depth and for 10 centimeter measurement they have 12 centimeter depth. So, you have a hole make that put the spacer then you put the sensor and you measure the value. So, that is the agriculture point of view. So, somebody is doing the soil study okay? they have to do that way and then of course, they have to calibrate the temperature sensor. So, the for the calibration of course, you do not expect the soil temperature will be very high. So, what they do they calibrate at two temperature one is the freezing point of water another is the boiling point of water. So, 0 degree and 100 degree. So, that is the two you have, have a linear characteristic. Now, for boiling for the freezing you assume it is 0 degree, but how can you ensure it is 0 degree. So, we have to measure the temperature and in the ice bath and it should be within plus minus 5, 0.5. So, ideally it is 0, but it is not 0. So, if it is within plus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 you can take it is ok. If you do not you have to add some ice or some water to bring the actual temperature within that range and then you dip your 
temperature sensor which you use for measurement. And you see how much your temperature sensor giving. So one of the common way is the ice bath. Because usually the boiling point you don't use. You don't go 100 degree centigrade for soil moisture. So if you have that, that gives actually one point. So sometimes it is better to have the calibration. So if you are, if you have got like $75,000 rupees sensor for the, calib for the measurement validation, if you have something like that around 20 degree, it will be very, very useful. But otherwise, you have only that still okay. So ice bath temperature at zero degree. So the measurement procedure is that you have to wait for some time. You cannot just dip it and take it because it takes some response time. So you have to wait for two minutes and then you have to see if it is, if it is, so sometimes depends on how much you allow. So here in this particular case, you do not bother even two degree, okay. You do not bother with two degree. So if the error is within plus minus two degree, it is still okay. So you do not go for very high precision temperature sensor for soil moisture applications. So many situations that they need to know every week, sometimes every month, sometimes season. So they need to have all the data. And now actually like global warming, that type of data is becoming more and more important. If you have data you know, 50 years, 100 years back, I mean all the soil, some place where the like Europe, the global warming talking, they have got some data for somewhere but not the data for all the place. But if they have the data, it's very, very good. So they need to go for weekly measurement and they also go for the season wise four times a year, like March, June, September, December, and they take the reading and average. So this is something. So why it is important? Because it's important from many aspect, okay. So uh, most important thing is the water for the plant and also how much nutrient they uptake. Storage also we need to know. Flooding, no, not much important but you still can have because if there are moisture is really high but if you have little bit flood, little bit water then it can actually create into flood. Weathering, atmospheric humidity. So these are all related for the soil moisture. And the, of course the scientists they need data for different other applications. So usually uh, you need some tools for making the 5 centimeter deep, 10 centimeter deep and you can take the reading. That circle you can make a little bit more bigger if you do not have that much accuracy and then you can take usually 3 samples to save time. You do not go for only 1 sample, so 3 sample and then take the average. And some people, they actually allow you to more data at different other radius. It depends on how big is your paddock. And so when you calibrate the sensor, it's important that your soil should be dry. So for, for us, like when we develop the sensor, we need to calibrate. So how do you do that? How can you say 0% moisture, 100% moisture? Okay. So we we take the soil, we make into, you know, grind it into, you know, very fine dust particle, put it into the microwave oven. Some people do under the sun, but under the sun is very hard because you may not be able to get sunlight, sufficient sunlight to make it completely dry. So microwave oven is used and then you can actually take the weight of the sample, adding water and then take out the dry and that way you can actually <coughs> express the percentage moisture in the sample and that is used for the, for the calibration. Okay, actually I, I, I was thinking of my sensor is here but I will have my sensor somewhere, I have to see, okay. So what we have developed is basically interdigital but it is a different structure. Uh, it is like a elliptical structure, okay. I will see where it is. So I thought it is there but it is not there. Okay, so I will present that one some other day. Okay, so 
Yeah, it will be there somewhere. I'll see. Okay, so any questions before we finish? It depends on how much accuracy you want. Usually, it comes like uh, in in the New Zealand scenario when the people use it comes down like around 500 to 600 dollar. But we use normal soil moisture sensor, which is not very accurate for our lab. Like we have developed a Wi-Fi based system, that's around like 20, 25 dollar. Not that, not 20. I mean, still like thousand rupees or so. Okay, but that does not give you very uh, good accuracy. So it's like a two electrode. You can just dip it into soil, and you can get some accuracy you know, within plus minus five percent. But if you want very good accuracy, they are actually based on very good electrode, and it can be a little bit expensive. That's what the normal agricultural applications you need to do. Usually, what they do, they they use a sensor which is fixed at some point, and uh, they made some arrangement when the if, suppose it rains, the rainwater will not be stagnant there; it will go down. So that type of special arrangement required to install the soil sensor, and that's what is is a little bit problem. If you have a standalone, you can just dip, you get. But if you want some continuous measurement, you have to make arrangement where the external factors, they do not affect it too much. <coughs> so it can be very costly as well as you can get cheaper one. But the good one is around like 500 to 600 dollar. Yes. Which temperature sensor we used? I don't actually remember the part number, uh, but we we use something like uh, minus 20 degree to like let us say around 70, 75 degree. There is a Motorola based temperature sensor which we used. I don't exactly remember the part. It's maybe MTS 105 or something like that. Okay, but I I don't exactly remember the one which we used. It's quite a few years now. Hmm. Like LM35 is normal, like up to 50 degree, 55 degree, uh, between zero. So it's it's good for the body temperature applications, but not for the weather because sometimes the weather can be minus. So we have to take the range a little bit more. I think MTS105 or something. It's a Motorola based uh, sensor, but I don't exactly remember the part number. Any other questions? They are not. They are not too much bothered about the soil properties, because they do not want. They cannot change the soil properties. So what they actually look into is the soil water, how much water they could actually provide without wasting the water, and sometimes they apply nutrient. Basically, nutrient means uh, three nutrients they want to apply: nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So there is a need of development of that sensor. So actually, we started, but then my student uh, something happened, uh, did not continue. But there is a need of NPK sensor. But most important thing is the water. So how you can save water? But in New Zealand, usually they do not use too much fertilizer. They do not use too much fertilizer. So you can you cannot think of urea or that type of things. Uh, used for the agriculture. No, I mean, you can see the problem for New Zealand is that you do not have any particular season because you have the cow, okay, <laughs> you have the lambs, they are grazing throughout the year. So you cannot actually say, oh, I'm cultivating paddy, so I need only for these three months. That type of opportunity they do not have. So it is required throughout the year. Now, sometime when it's a rainy season, they cannot 
use that aggregator and irrigator because the irrigator not required. The most important thing is the summer time when you need to apply water. So that's the most important time they need it more. Anything else? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much and I will actually see you on 26th.